Hello, everyone. Welcome to One from 100,000 Social Innovation Symposium. This season is season 12. Our theme is co-prototyping future classroom, social innovation and design thinking for 21st century learning. I am your moderator today, Jonathan from JCDC, the Jockey Club Design Institute for Social Innovation. In this season, we would conclude the past experiences we have gathered over the few years on social innovation. We have invited experts from many fields today to think about how to push for change in education and to expand the Im imagination of the public and professionals with regards to education, teaching and learning. Our team would also make a social innovation learning tool handbook. And uh, after this symposium, we will tell you how to get one. Before we start, I want to remind everyone that uh, on the top right hand corner of our uh, live page, there are two buttons, agenda and questions. If you want to uh, pose any questions during the symposium, please use our Q&A function. Our guests will try to answer your questions as best they can. Without further ado, let us invite Mr. Ling Ka Kan, the director of JCDC, to deliver some opening remarks. KK, please. Good morning, everyone. We welcome guests both online and offline to one from 100,000 Social Innovation Symposium. Our theme in season 12 is co-prototyping future classroom, social innovation and design thinking for 21st century learning. One from 100,000 is a seasonal social innovation platform at JCDC. We have started in year 2018. The 12th season of social innovation is the last season of the first three years of our plan. Looking back at the past 11 seasons, we have talked about interim housing, elderly entrepreneurship, and the social design for uh, elderly friendly and harmonized social spaces. And we also talk about subdivided units. Experts from multiple fields who care have congregated together to provide practical and innovative solutions. Today, our theme is education. According to the 2018 Future Jobs Report by the World Economic Forum, by the year 2022, a lot of uh, old jobs will disappear. But at the same time, there will be even more new jobs in a new economy. A lot of the new jobs do not exist yet. The Hong Kong education system has seen many changes, but currently it is still exam-oriented. It emphasizes competi competition. That's why we must think about whether the knowledge our students learn today could uh, work, apply in the world of the future. In the 21st century, Students need capabilities way beyond memorizing answers. They must learn how to use new technology and adapt to social changes. And ideally, we would like our students to be innovative people who are capable of bringing forth change. Ever since year 2018, JCDC has started our social innovation plan. We are putting social innovation and design thinking, these two elements, into our high school curriculum so that our students could learn from thinking and uh, making activities to nurture their confidence in innovation and their collaborative problem-solving skills. At the same time, we are also providing relevant training to teachers and teachers in training. Our plan has obtained widespread support in the academic world. There are 17 uh, high schools, secondary schools participating in 20 different programs, including 154 uh, workshops and uh, 20 uh, teachers' workshops. Through this symposium, we hope to conclude our experience in the past three years and to promote this unique way of teaching to more educators so that they could introduce that into their daily education. 
I thank our guests very much for taking the time to participate in the symposium to share their experiences and opinions with us. Firstly, I would like to thank our uh, guest of honor, Ms. Betsy Lai, Principal Assistant Secretary, Civil Service Training and Development, Civil Service Bureau, HKSAR, to deliver the opening address. And I would like to also thank you to all our other guest speakers to talk about how to train teachers and students. In they include Dr. Patrick Yun, Senior Lecturer at the Department of Curriculum and Instruction, the Education University of Hong Kong, Dr. Jesse Chow, Lecturer, Faculty of Education, the University of Hong Kong, and Professor Siu Keng Chong, Associate Professor, School of Design, the Hong Kong Polytechnic University. Furthermore, we would like to thank all participating teachers, students, designers and the representatives from the EDB to share with us their experience in education innovation. I would particularly to offer my heartfelt thanks to the 17 uh, high uh, secondary institutions and these uh, principals and teachers who participate in our plan and the NGO workers and the government representatives. Over the past three years, we have engaged in experimentation together and to bring forth changes in the education sector. And once again, I'd like to thank the Hong Kong Jockey Club for their sponsorship and support. Without them, social innovation would not be possible. Finally, I must thank all of our colleagues at the JCDC. In the past few years, they have been courageous and responsible in dedicating themselves in the work of social innovation. They have created great positive social impact. I feel very proud of your achievements. So the symposium officially begins. I hope that everybody will have a fruitful morning. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. KK. Next, we would like to invite Ms. Betsy Life, Principal Assistant Secretary, Civil Service Training and Development Civil Service Bureau, HKSAR, to deliver the opening address. Ms. Betsy Lai, apart from uh, being responsible for the uh, Training and Development Bureau at the Civil Service Bureau, he's also responsible for assessment and tr uh, training policy and to um, develop new civil service training institutions. Today, Ms. Betsy Lai will talk about building future workforce capabilities and how her view on the current uh, landscape of learning. Good morning, everyone. Good morning to guests both online and offline. Thank you for the Polytechnic University and KK giving me this opportunity to share with you my fee uh, how I feel about the work and the future world of human resources. So my topic today is uh, what, what kind of capacities are necessary in the future workforce? So let's take one step further. Just now, KK has talked about the 2018 World Economic Forum report, and now I'm talking about the World, World Economic Forum report in year 2020. They have uh, some updates. So just like what KK said, in year 2025, we would face two major uh, impacts. Firstly, because more and more things are digitalized and automized, and that would create an impact. And secondly, because after COVID-19, the economy is deeply impacted. And as I've said before, the report stipulates that uh, a lot of jobs will disappear, but we don't have to worry because uh, 97 million new jobs will reemerge. But these new jobs may not require old skills. They may require more advanced, more cutting edge skills, and we have to upskill ourselves. Our young people, how should they prepare themselves uh, for the future world? We as uh, educators or trainers, how could we make preparations accordingly? So here I would like to bring up three points, uh, three skills which I considered most important. And this is basically my idea, uh, the idea that I have all along as well. So by year 2025, let me talk about the third point first. When we are facing difficult challenges, how could we solve them? And secondly, do we have the learning capacity? Would we proactively seek out learning? Is there a strategy, a direction when it comes to our learning? And most, most importantly, are we capable of analytic thought and innovative thought? So the future world, the future world of work will, uh, will pose a lot of challenges to our students. We must change the way we think. 
uh, I would like to uh, talk about George Kouros, an educator that I admire. Uh, this is something that he has said. Firstly, in the past, we have a certain types of uh, preconceived notions. In other words, we think that oh, there are certain uh, skills which we think is necessary. Say, learning the piano is a very good example. Some people may think, oh, I, I'm not gifted. I, I can't learn that. I, I won't be able to do that. I would like to learn other things. I have other skills. That's what type of preconceived notion. And secondly, we as trainers or and educators, of course, we hope that people could nurture and grow and people could learn all sorts of things. Even if you are not talented enough to be a talented pianist, you could uh, work hard of them and to learn piano. I see a uh, lot of people who dedicate themselves into learning piano. They could achieve grade 8 in ABRSM. Even a lot of genius painters, they practice every day. That's how they become masters. So you have to have that growth mindset. And a newer mindset is that if we have this grown mindset, when we uh, work on this path step by step. Most importantly, we have to have the uh, mindset of a creator, of an innovator. So when we are learning piano, it's not such as our fingering. We hope that we could create new music. This is quite interesting. So I'm a bookish person. I have a book club. Recently, we were reading a book by C.C. Poon. Uh, and uh, I really like uh, C.C. Poon's work. And I actually... I have a newly acquainted, uh, made two new friends. Uh, they are working in the art world, and they have created a musical with CC's uh, script. And some of them work on uh, stage design. Some of them make new music, and they created a new project. And during our book club sessions, we really enjoyed our discussion. And we talk about uh, what would the male protagonist look like. So people of different age imagine different different images. Like I thought it would be a bookish person, and they thought it would be a, a confident eye banker. So I think texts are very important. Texts inspire our uh, imagination. So as I've started, uh, everybody's Mr. Darcy is different. Every, uh, everybody has different fantasies. So next, I would like to uh, talk about uh, three different things. Once again, I would uh, use uh, Innovator's Mindset, a book by George Burris. He talks where he says that as an innovator, what kind of mindset must we have? What's the characteristic we must have? There are eight things. So let me quickly go through it. Uh, they are interrelated. So I think not only we want our students to be uh, innovators, we in the education work or we as trainers, we have to have that kind of mindset ourselves first. If we do not have that mindset, it's difficult for us to train students with that mindset. The first thing is empathy, empathetic. We have to think when we teach, when we engage in daily class, when we design our classes, if I sit uh, in our, my classroom, would I feel bored? We have to think about that. Do we have a story for them? Do we have practical examples, real-life experiences to share? So we, in our work uh, as a training, a part of the Training Development Council, a lot of our colleagues are very talented. They know more than we do. What can we do to ensure that they value our training as well? Firstly, we must be empathetic. Some people would talk about this new idea called flipped classroom. In other words, you uh, read everything at uh, home first, and then in the class, we would do uh, schoolwork or we would uh, do uh, discussions. And whatever questions you have, you could pose them then. This may be a more efficient use of our time. We could do more with this model. So I would bring up some further examples later on. The second issue is, are we a uh, someone who poses questions? So I am some, one of those people who ask a lot of questions. I remember when I was young, uh, I think older people might remember, there's a book called uh, 10,000 Whys. Uh, so when I'm talking about uh, to, to my scientist colleagues, I, I, they would say that they would uh, bring up these books and they realize they have forgotten a lot of the basic fundamental scientific facts. So this really shows that whether we ask questions during our daily life, during our daily work, or do you just accept everything you hear, questioning is very important. In when we are engaging in designing the curriculum, do we question our curriculum or, or do we just accept everything we hear? And thirdly, is an adventurous spirit. So we must be 
courageous in trying new things. KK could talk about this more. So even though I am not really a teacher myself, but I really like to share with you what we do in our workplace. And furthermore, is to develop a network. Well, why was I, where did I find a book club? Because um, I think one thing, others may have other opinion. No one is an island. No one knows everything. So we have to learn how to share. I heard that uh, one of my students said, uh, a student was telling me that when different people collaborate, they could nurture new ideas and bring forth new opinions. That is very important. That's why in a flipped classroom, a lot of the times, we ourselves would engage in group discussions. So it's very interesting in Chinese that we have friends and in the classroom, some people just they just keep asking questions and following up questions again and again. Actually, this is exactly a lot of our clients. You know, sometimes in other classrooms they were very quiet, but in the group discussion they have so much to talk about. They have a lot in their mind because maybe they feel shy and not want to be embarrassing. So during the group discussion, they just want to talk and everybody wants to share. So this kind. This form, actually, we can try. The, the, the other one is about observation. Observation. I mean, a lot of the details in our life. We can be more observant and uh, try to expand your people network. Why somebody else is, um, is successful, and what are they really good at? So we must be more careful. And we love nature. In the nature, be it trees and the birds. They have their way to live their life to survive. So in the world, in this nature, we can still learn a lot. Another thing is, we must have the capability as so being an innovator. So we must have new ways to, you don't have to, you know, just for the sake of finishing your homework. So going to the trade shows, going to the exhibitions, and to see that the students, they use the different ways by video making or by making an ad, so on and so forth. Now, these are the new innovative ways. Because of the pandemic, we have already created a lot of new ways. So we need some adaptability. We must have this uh, mindset of uh, thinking about future proactively. So with our co-workers, we may work in different places. We may encounter different environments in work. Some jobs may disappear. For example, after the pandemic, some pilots, they may stop working. Some of uh, the uh, the uh, service uh, personnel uh, they don't have any work, so we have to must we must have this mindset to keep learning new skills. We have to reflect. We have learned a lot, but are they really useful? Which pathway should be the correct for us to keep learning? Reflection is really important. Sometimes we may just uh, take a step back and uh, think about what ways work and what do not. So sometimes I talk to my colleagues. Maybe in one year time, just uh, look back at your uh, your. Uh, your your diary and all your calendar experience, whether there's any minus or plus. And the next year, the environment will be different. So if your job disappears, can you still re look at your CV and apply for a new job? So just look at your CV. So this is a way to reflect. I talk about these eight things, and this is the one just the one part. Having this man with thinking and being an innovator, we are ed educators in our training courses. We have to provide, think about what kind of environment we must provide in the um, practical environment. So we are taking the lead to cultivate the talents in such environment. What can we do about the um, uh, environment? Chris talked about eight eight points, and I just shared with you three points just now. So um, this uh, great points, let me put them together. First of all, to create a, um, opportunities for the uh, innovators so that they can raise their own questions, they can think about the questions and find the solutions finally. So during the training, we also saw some experiential learning into our training course. These are not those disabled personnel, they are our trainees, our colleagues from different departments, lawyers, engineers, and so on and so forth. Sometimes we have to um, we have uh, they will explain to us what they feel. For example, for the disabled people, so there will be a path for them uh, when they will use the wheelchair. For example, cr cross the train street, um, going to uh, to the uh, water dispenser by um, you know uh, taking this path. So through this um, design, we found that some in the pedestrian period, uh, pedestrian area, the uh, street was not even. Uh, 
close, and uh, sometimes the, you know, if you use a wheelchair, it cannot be fast enough, while the traffic lights were very busy. So water dispenser for some people is really hard for them to get water through the water dispenser. Sometimes the, the ramp, and um, for those uh, wheel ch or wheelchairs, so even though the um, ramp was uh, very good, very nice, but the slope, the, the scope is too high. It's really difficult for them to go up, and sometimes they will just want to go to the toilet, but cannot go up. So being a designer, we have to think about all this. This also has a lot to do with their sympathy. And uh, um, so why we say that we need connected learning, we have to know different people, expand our network so as to learn more things or different things. And sometimes we have to, we can also go through the competitions or contests. So through the contest, we can streamline what we have learned. Every two to three years, we have an excellent service award for all the public servants in different departments. People, they can just put up what they have achieved for contest. We also hire external referees from other companies. And from the training point of view, from the very beginning, we teach the colleagues how to prepare a scripts, how to present in front of the referees, and how to streamline your information or document. Sometimes you have to do that kind of a streaming so that you will be able to answer questions from the referees. This is the training we provide. We have to think about what weaknesses we have still. There's another way. At the context, we can learn skills from others by observing what other people do, how they present uh, their ideas. So we go to different contests that we find a lot of innov innovative things from different people. So you, we need this kind of environment in order to stimulate innovation instead of working in your office all the time in your department. We have this plan. We also work together with the uh, Education Bureau and uh, schools. We made some videos. We also went to different uh, trade shows or the uh, the uh, exhibitions and uh, the uh, Education um, um, the Administration Bureau also encourages great a lot. It's over 100 items each year. So a reflection, we have a lot of training courses for people. And finally, I want to say that reflection in the past, every three months in the classroom, we will invite our colleagues back to summarize after getting back to the office what have they learned. Because of the pandemic, we haven't been able to do it. We have to do it online. This is also an innovative way. Some work, uh, some colleagues just set up a website. They also, also designed some some of their own logos and some homework. Some people, they wrote some articles, took some pictures, so that we have a platform for us to reflect together. So when they do homework, when they meet, they can also start talking about what they have learned. These are the new ways, and these are also very important. Okay, the third part, I'll be very brief. The working environment is really critical or uh, important to the uh, to our uh, colleagues and the what new requirements on the scales for example the observer of a superior and uh, recently it was very, has been very hot and um, this is the the weather changes is are really out of control all of a sudden there's the shower um, and uh, this the the heavy rain and uh, sometimes we we cannot expect for the typhoon now we have already done quite a lot in research for example the uh, uh, for the typhoon the uh, we have uh, the um, the uh, black blue uh, signal for over 10 years ever after the Second World War, we haven't experienced that much. And uh, well, remember, I was in the Philippines, and 82 people died of it, and um, numerous people, they, uh, they were injured, and uh, tens of thousands of houses just uh, fell apart, and the trees also fell apart. But in Hong Kong, we didn't have um, so many casualties because of the early warning of the uh, of the. Uh, of the typhoon, so being the uh, science dean, what they had learned or what they have done. So a lot of them, they studied math, they studied physics. Of course, uh, they were very accurate with a lot of equipment and devices. And uh, they also had done a lot of engineering projects before. They were uh, t working together with international organizations on, on, on weather science. So of course, we need big data 
data analytics and the AI uh, analytics as well. So the, first of all, very importantly, how could they share this information or communicate this in, in information with people? So people didn't understand what this data was. So why why you hadn't told us about this heavy rain beforehand? So actually about uh, some of the weather, the uh, weather uh, understanding of the weather. So there are a lot of uh, ways for us to communicate the relevant information to people. They tried different means, they tried different ways. Many years ago, if you were old enough, you know that in the past, you had to listen to the videos in order to listen to the weather report and the weather forecast. Uh, if you're a fisherman, you had to. And uh, there were their signs in, and uh, they didn't have much time uh, telling about this uh, science. So in 1996, we set up a website, making it possible for us to show more information and uh, pictures to people. And uh, in 2006, the mobile app was developed. In Hong Kong, um, maybe in Hong Kong, this is one of the most downloadable, uh, downloaded app in, in the world, very successful. I believe that in your mobile phone, you, might, you may have that app. And then we have a YouTube and a Facebook, a lot of uh, videos. A lot of the videos was done by the uh, colleagues in the uh, observatory by themselves. So, for example, a lot of information, a lot of uh, science-related information was put there, including words and uh, and uh, pictures. And uh, also the crowdsourcing as well. During the typhoon, for example, the Shanzhou, uh, they couldn't get so much, um, so many pictures. So they asked people to uh, take photos and uh, submit it to them. So that's why, with the involvement of ordinary people. So it was based on the uh, science information and the science knowledge. However, it was delivered through different ways so that people were, under, were able to understand. This is a new innovation, and um, they were bold enough to provide to provide a certain environment to people give the uh, play their role by making videos, by participating in the contests. For example, the uh, weather leaders and. Uh, some people they work in the uh, in the office. They were also active in participating in all the programs. So from 1997, we set up uh, this. Uh, this is the signal. Uh, this is a balloon leaking there. And may maybe many of you have never seen that. But now we have Facebook and Instagram to warn people beforehand before the uh, typhoon comes. So this is the purpose. They, and also people understand what is the science knowledge, and they also understand what is the difficult, what is uh, the hard work they had done. So about, uh, I remember, three points were raised in the uh, World Economic Forums, which I all agree to them. Number two and number three points. So those are what we needed. And uh, the first point is the new edition, which is different from the 2012. We need innovative thinking. If you ask me, so no matter whether it is innovative uh, thinking or problem solving, I think the second point is most important. Learning is the most important one. In our work, we call it the learning agility and uh, how to learn and how to learn actively so that you can solve problems. So being educators and the trainers, we have to provide a learning environment to people and create opportunities for them to participate in more contests. And finally, I want to say the communication skills. This is uh, it's not being written here, but I think it is important. We have the thinking, but if you are not really good at communicating or expressing yourself, then you can do. So I think uh, basically that's all I want to share with you. So. Um, now, I think that too much is not good. Just uh, take the action. We have to provide more opportunities to our dear friends for them to get more involvement, to learn more, know more people so that we can work together. Thank you very much, and I hope that we can keep connected. I have uh, an email address here, and if you have interest, in the please feel free to contact me. Thank you, Betsy, for your sharing. So before we start the uh, discussions, we would like to take a collective photo for all our guests.
Thank you, everyone. Without further ado, let us start the panel discussion. So the theme of this discussion is preparing educators for the 21st century classroom. We have experienced scholars to share their experiences with us, including Dr. Patrick Yun, Senior Lecturer, Department of Curriculum and Instruction, the Education University of Hong Kong, Dr. Jesse Chow, Lecturer at the Faculty of Education at the University of Hong Kong, and Professor Siu King Chong, Associate Professor, School of Design, the Hong Kong Polytechnic University. We're delighted to be able to invite uh, Tracy Chan uh, of Ethnovators to act as our uh, moderator. Ethnovator is a uh, non is a nonprofit platform dedicated to innovating education. Tracy is one of its members. He she is passionate about uh, working with the youth. She hopes that the younger generation in school and out of school could have uh, lively developments. We would like to invite Tracy first. Tracy, please. Good morning, everyone, uh, on both online and offline. I'm delighted to invite you to join us to think about how the future classroom will look like. So uh, some of our guests have already mentioned this before. We hope uh, what kind of capacities and abilities we hope our students would have in the future. But before we talk about our future, let us return to the present. If we want to develop these uh, capabilities, what could we do now to make sure that happens? Each and every teacher and educator is a very important participant. We sow the seeds which will sprout in the future. So I'm uh, thinking about uh, the when Ms. Betsy Lai was sharing, uh, the, the innovator mindset is very important. We as educators and as teachers, how could we make sure that we have those uh, characteristics as well. So I'm very delighted to invite these three guests to talk with us how should we think about or how should we innovate training of educators and how could different educators uh, nurture our next generation. Without further ado, we'd like to invite our first guest, Dr. Patrick Yun, Senior Lecturer at the Department of Curriculum and Instruction at the Education University of Hong Kong. Patrick has engaged in uh, many types of research uh, in different er, in the edu area of education, including uh, learning achievements, electronic uh, course design and implementation, and we will talk about the uh, training and education in the 21st century. Thank you, Tracy, and good morning uh, to all the guests online and offline. I'm Patrick. I'm senior lecturer of the, at the Department of Curriculum and Instruction at the Education University of Hong Kong, and my other piece of work is uh, school experience. So. Uh, teachers in training uh, would coordinate their uh, their uh, their experiences in uh, schools, and I'm also one of the uh, participants in the Catchstone project. So it's really difficult to talk about everything that we do within the ten minutes. But uh, we would like to talk about uh, how our work pertains to the 21st century challenges and uh, so to reflect with everybody on that topic. So our university is a university which trains teachers. And we would like to uh, use a yardstick or certain standards to look at our how we do. We have a PNI, in other words, professional excellence, ethical responsibility, and innovation. So these terms look very grandiose, but how could we uh, train a professional and good teacher? What? So professionalism is not only about. Uh, uh, their own discipline and teaching their own discipline. Uh, we must also think about what else does professionalism entail and what does a good teacher mean. So in the past five years, we have been developing different concepts to understand that idea better. So different uh, teachers would have different uh, unique uh, traits. Um, for example, uh, ethical, how could we cater to uh, different learning capabilities and how could we decide how to do this. And today we are bringing forth innovation. As I see that uh, the environment is changing, there's attack and there's a lot of social changes. Innovation is about problem solving, it's about design thinking. So we encourage our students to do this. So we can see that uh, students have, a, have the innovative mindset when they are trying to work on application, they develop uh, mobile phone apps to solve problems. We also see that um, 
these uh, students, just like when in just like in other universities, we have ILOs, intended learning outcomes. So uh, our previous uh, speakers have shared about in ILOs, including the four C's, communication, collaboration, uh, creativity, or critical thinking. So apart from that, more importantly, our students in the future will become teachers. So uh, their social interacting skills, their communication skills, written, oral, are also very important. And uh, furthermore, a global perspective is also important. So in the future, we are talking about uh, entrepreneurship, leadership, it particularly in 21st century, uh, our challenges come in very quick cycles. So we hope that they would have leadership skills as well. Our course design has four major pillars, including language, that's very important, GE, general education, and there's cross-disciplinary learning. So later on, I will talk more about cross-disciplinary learning. In the past two years, we've done a lot of liberal studies, cross-disciplinary learning, and we also have uh, learning opportunities overseas and field experiences. Of course, each and every teacher, uh, they have different majors, they have different uh, expertise, and, and they are different minor studies they could choose from. Apart from that, our students would uh, quickly uh, start to practice their craft in schools, and in the third, second, and third year, we would have placement opportunities. So our students would be moved from a classroom to a school, so they would actually work on the front lines. And so we would look into what needs, what expectations, and what requirements they may have. And uh, because there are many stakeholders in schools, so uh, there would be, we would have a T standard plus net, a committee between principals and uh, schools. So we hope that our uh, our, stu our students, our teachers in training could learn from the activities they engage in schools and the subsequent reviews. Uh, so uh, in the future, we have to be student-centric. Students should develop comprehensively. They should prepare for the future world. And they must be agile when, we've, when facing the future. So uh, what does it mean to be student-centric? Uh, what is that? What training and what placement does it entail? What capacities must our teachers have? Firstly, we must be co-constructors of knowledge. In other words, uh, we could co-construct uh, different types of knowledge, or even in the spiral form, we could integrate uh, our own elements to that uh, teaching so that we could make this more effective. And secondly, we must be a caring cultivators. We must care about our students. So returning to the school example, we remember when our teachers care about us, right? They talk to us, they understand our needs, and they care about us. So we want our students to know that our teachers care for them. And fun next is role models. Role models is a difficult thing. So we, in our minds, may have our own role models. They are exemplary individuals. And in the 21st century, our students learn through different many ways, like through the media, through uh, the internet, and through mobile phones. Their role models. Uh, will also change as the social structure change. So we could offer them guidance, but there's a lot of challenges still. So let me uh, spend a little bit more time to share with you uh, what I see in the education university as a developed trainer of tra teachers. So most of our students would become teachers, and some of them would come back to the school to engage in PTP courses. So I've been talking about outcome base. So we uh, have an outcome based strategy, and we also have a Gino's generics. So in terms of course designing and the program and the courses, and even uh, when it comes to individual uh, classes, we know we pay a lot of attention to what learning outcomes we have achieved and what skills that we cultivate. And secondly, we have a different strategy. So we have been talking about this to other scholars. Apart from passing on knowledge, perhaps we have a greater responsibility to teach uh, people how to learn. Uh, in other words, meta-qualitative. Uh, in the 21st century, knowledge and information is everywhere. We have to differentiate what is true and what is false and what is important knowledge and how should we learn that ourselves. So in other words, there should be self-regulated learning, self-motivated learning, or even self-assessment and self-reflection. 
We think that is even more important. We hope that our teachers in training could bring these elements to their practice. And in other words, we also have GEIC, General Education Interdisciplinary Courses. So in other words, they are, these are cross-disciplinary courses. I would give more examples later on. To tell to tell you uh, how we engage in cross disciplinary training work for our teachers in training, so that our teachers would learn more about the world. And in the past few years, we did in a catchstone project. I know that Polytechnic University has a very good education reputation in the catchstone project. So some of our graduating theses, apart from doing research, we hope that we could also make products, make designs to actually achieve something in order to actually help the school to uh, solve these problems. So we have to do these innovative catch these project. We also have experiential learning. We also would have uh, professors talking to us about that in the, later on. Uh, a lot of our teachers in training, they are actually engaging in practical work, like working with uh, the Red Cross and other NGOs at uh, certain events, and to learn in that environment and service and exchange. And furthermore, I pay a lot of attention also to field experience. When uh, students are training in the school, when they are working, uh, it's w w learning in school and working in the front lines is very diff different. A lot of the times, our students would uh, study for five years, and they realize that the placement in the third to five year is very important. This is where they are truly integrated into the school environment, and there's also a co-construction model of learning. We try to uh, learn by doing and to propose uh, you know, practical cases. Well, I won't go deep into the textbooks, but as I've said, uh, there's a flipped classroom, right? So our students would learn themselves, and we would provide them with problems to solve. And furthermore, uh, there should be e-learning and practical education, e-pedagogy. So. <laughs> Uh, in the past couple of years, uh, particularly during the COVID times, we talk about edtech. But furthermore, to, apart from edtech, edtech is just a tool. The more important thing is how do you design the course? How do you reduce the differences between the learning capacities? And how do you care more about the growth of uh, students? That's more important. So here, we are uh, focusing more on the design of our courses. And I will also talk about e-portfolios. And we had also did a lot of AI projects. I'll talk about that as well. So let us look at our GEIC first. So in the final clause, uh, growing up and living in AI with AI in society, I participated in that. So. We have uh, worked with our English teachers, and we have worked with our MIT and mathematics teachers. And, and we, all together, we made this GIC course. We had to try to train our students on AI and English and how to design. Le uh, and, uh, the, and we also introduced elements of design. We did all this in order to f integrate our students into the actual 21st century scenario. And furthermore, e-portfolio, you can see that there's an award. This is also very important. Apart from recording their own placements or what they were done in school, a more important thing is that we hope that they could be reflective thinkers. They could reflect uh, their own values, their own strategies through their teaching, and they could achieve personal growth. So all these strategies are things that we have focused on over the past two years. So I'll share with everyone uh, you know, how uh, this is basically sums up my sharing with regards to 21st century education and its challenges. Thank you for Patrick's sharing. I think everybody is exploring different options into better training our future teachers. So. Uh, the, as we mentioned before, there's service learning, experiential learning, and we know that other institutions have also made attempts at uh, uh, nurturing this as well. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Jesse Chow, lecturer at the Faculty of Education at the University of Hong Kong. She has also been making use of these social networks to work with different schools and different uh, social institutions to establish networks to bring forth new opportunities for our students so that they could learn through experiential learning through open learning to think about their world, to learn about the world more, and to think about how they relate to others. Well, we hand the floor over to Jesse. Thank you, Tracy. First of all, I must thank the invitation from the Jockey Club. 
Poly U Jockey Club has uh, actually two universities, uh, two schools. We have done a lot of things in similarities. I would like to share with you uh, I'm working in the University School of Education, uh, Hong Kong University, and uh, we focus the greater lot on the uh, practices. We focus greater lot on the third tier of uh, learning and the communities. So what is it? So one of the uh, keywords we talked about is that the change, the world is changing so quickly. What about the future? So nobody doubts this saying. Actually, the way we train our teachers doesn't change great a lot. For example, we uh, teach them the bachelor degrees. We taught up, uh, teach them about the educational methodologies and the very basic practices in the universities. And when they graduate in classrooms, they will be confident in speaking in front of all the students and uh, guiding the growth of all students. So yet one thing that we have discussed is about why are we training our teachers? How can we make them become or turn into teachers? So this is something that we may need to change. Shall we constrain them in universities, in schools? In that case, then we will miss the most important opportunities in terms of experience, social innovation, as well as a lot of, um, lot of new knowledge in communities. Because they are new, they are new teachers, just like the skilled people. They are not just the skilled people. We think that they have other uh, other qualities, the abilities to innovate, to adapt, as well as um, the uh, courage. In different uh, social, uh, in different classrooms, we have uh, a lot of uh, students. They have uh, concerns about the social, the how to answer those questions. So having an uncertain future, so having a kind of aliveness. So we need to have those type of students and future teachers. About five to six years ago, those were our puzzles. And at that time, we started thinking about how should we change in training our teachers. So we we think that we must demolish all the four walls in, in universities, but mixing our training courses with community learning. So we did something quite controversial. So the community-based practice and learning is made into one of the mandatory courses, not only for the um, postgraduate, but also for the uh, gra graduate level. So for the PCD, PGD, you know, students, after they finish the four-year training for the, they came as for the PGD training. For them, this is a very, very precious um, experience because this is a, one of the mandatory courses. If you look at here, here, a lot of students, the, in South, they went to the theme parks, uh, for, sorry, in their local theme parks. They were promoting uh, environmental protection. I look at this picture. Some other students said they went to the Tibet research, researching on sustainability. They also worked together with local students uh, talking about uh, the impact from over traveling. Some other students, they went to Cambodia and uh, work with uh, the, uh, to work with uh, the, uh, the grassroots about uh, the people trafficking, how to help people. So all this work for the external reviews, uh, so according to them, actually our work, our community-based learning has a great a lot of a moral agenda inside. We also discovered that through the community-based work, we greatly improved the students' their teaching readiness. After all, our students, they are from different communities, and getting them involved into communities earlier just make them more confident so that they will be able to deal with different students in different environments. We did research and got data. We've discovered that through this kind of experienced learning, they grew and uh, they, grew, they, they grew a lot of uh, capacities and competence that are needed in the 21st century, for example, ability of uh, innovate, of uh, reflect, and as well as uh, the confidence of being a future teacher, as well as sense of res responsibility and the teamwork. 
all these qualities, according to the economic, the World Economic Forum, these are the competence and the skills that will be needed in the future. What about our methodology, our community-based, experience-based learning? So one of the important things among many is that uh, this is the mutual benefit relationship. It's not beneficial to our students only. It's also beneficial to the communities for those different organizations. So we need to have this mutual benefit relationship between them, different NGOs and organizations. They work together with us, innovating knowledge in this our teacher training program. And uh, our in our cooperation, we are equal parties. So one of the things I mentioned before, we have a mandatory courses, we have across disciplinary courses. A lot of our courses were from different other uh, departments and the students could participate. And uh, we have our scores as well. So we also took another action in addition to a grade that uh, students participate and got A's and B's and uh, and the GPAs, uh, we also give out pass and fails. Uh, sometimes it is quite it is beautiful, and may not be that welcome because if it is just a pass and a fail, if you look at the data in the past years, we have a lot of uh, courses oversubscribed, uh, oversubscribed. A lot of students were from other university or other schools and other departments. So this made us even more confident on this experience-based learning. And we have a very strong sense of motivation in it, because we could feel that this is the power of a change in it. Just as Patrick said, reflection is very important. So among them, one important element is that students need to make reflections in different ways. You don't have to write down your reflection. You just like to kept down some of the voice or different ways for the students to reflect about their identities. Now, finally, let me share with you a, a something a, a person. I think so. Sometimes people are selflessness. Spend a lot of time. Uh, so he spent a great a lot of uh, time and uh, taking care of our students and the NGOs. So in the past few years, so these are the uh, footprints of our students. Our classroom is just like like the uh, the uh, uh, global village or the village of the earth. So when we designed this course, Missing Gray in her words, has been guiding us, and uh, we keep reflecting on how how to cultivate a teaching force. And so this is the wild witness. Uh, so we are, we have a curiosity on uh, on life, and uh, we have a passion on the environment. So this is uh, very impactful for us. Now, finally, if you want to know more about us, we have our website. In the website, you can find more videos and uh, visual tours and so on and so forth about uh, the courses of our students. And uh, you can, you're most welcome to have a look. Uh, if you have any queries, and please also feel feel free to write me an email about the courses. Thank you, thank you, Jesse, for your sharing. So from Jesse's presentation, we know that the uh, actually we can demolish the four walls uh, to cultivate our students you know, across in different jails or different territories. In the past one or two years, so we have experienced a different the, the combination of teaching online and offline. And what about the roadmap to the future? So how can we change the uh, the uh, curriculum designing, the uh, teaching delivery methodology, as well as uh, the design uh, thinking as well, so which is also important. Our next speaker is um, Professor Siu King Chong, Associate Professor, School of Design, Hong Kong Polytech University. He's got a lot of uh, experience in uh, the social and um, and uh, he's going to share with us what kind of uh, new thinking we have to make in our teacher uh, training. Thank you. In non, from uh, 1993, I started making a uh, teacher's program on 
the uh, art and the education started training teachers. And uh, I have been running this program for over 20 years. And later, I changed this this course into a, uh, a senior year recently. It's a top of degree. So we call it the uh, social innovation design course. In uh, the past 20, 30 years, I have been thinking about uh, some questions. So in your in your the first edition of your journal about uh, the uh, so, social innovation, design thinking, and so on and so forth, so, so forth. What are you actually doing? So this is uh, also the topic of my presentation today. Now let's uh, have a discussion about these three concepts. What are they? What is the uh, connections between them or correlations between them? And uh, purely based on my own thinking, let's have a look among these uh, three concepts. What are they and uh, what connections they have? Now let's look at what is uh, the creativity. Sometimes I just uh, scratch my head. So creativity in Chinese, in the context of a Chinese, when we put we put it into you know Chuang Yi for creativity. But if you think it deeper, in a Chinese context, creativity well, this word should not be put into Chuang Yi only. Because for me, Chuang Yi is kind of misleading. Because when we talk about Chuang Yi or creativity, you can think anything. I think out of the box, we just encourage our students to think out of the box. But if you think about the Chinese equivalent for this word, creativity, so we have create inside, we have construct inside, we have the invent inside, we have build inside. So construct and build, and then we have innovate inside, right? So seldom have we put creativity into the combination of all these words, because these words have included the the create, the invent, the build, and the construct, and so forth, as well as in, uh, innovate inside. So sometimes we think about the creativity, we think we can think out of the box. But for me, create, uh, creativity is that you just uh, think about it, or so all these things. If they cannot be implemented, then what is the meaning inside? So I really like discussing, for example, if I is uh, holding my hand uh, here and uh, I'm uh, talking about it, if you don't just uh, talk, if you don't act, then uh, it is. Um, that is not creativity, creative practice, creative making. These two are very important, very important action or activity. You can look at it in this way. You have creativity, you can make something, but how can you really implement your ideas? You have to do, you have to really hand on doing it. So you create, you make. So you practice. Practice is a, a very general word, but making. Making is a very important media of learning. Or if you look at the uh, relationship between create, uh, to construct and uh, create and create. For example, in the in the you draw a, uh, for example, some chairs in the picture. So how can we mobilize different people using different chairs in different ways? Actually, this is a creative establishment. So the creative establishment. means that we have to make certain systems or establish certain rules in order to manufacture the social system that we depend upon. Uh, you can see what is creativity, what does it mean to make new things, 
to me, it means that when uh, everybody uses chairs to develop a certain system in the classroom to sit row by row, but other people decide to uh, put arrange those chairs in a circle, that may be a type of creativity. So creativity is just a matter or a relative matter. So now we know that uh, sitting around in a circle is not really creative anymore. Do we have any other newer ways to uh, do lessons? So the concept of creativity is a relative one. So if we believe in that, in other words, how could we create a different scenario How could we think about uh, different creative insights? Uh, so this is actually a uh, very important perspective on education. So I have to go back to my starting point and think about what is uh, creative insight. So the word insight entails a lot of things. It could be about uh, foresight. It could be about uh, a perspective, a discovery, or or, uh, uh, or to uh, be learned or to uh, have seen many things. It has uh, many meanings uh, pertaining to the concept of sight. So after you see all these things and you could find gaps between these different things, that's how you gain insight and foresight, and that precisely is what we call insight. And I call that creative insight. A lot of the time we would say, oh, we don't have insight. We don't have insight because we do have not seen enough things. We, uh, we are limited by our can, and we do not see that there are a lot of things outside in the world which already exists. We just don't know of it, and we mistakenly think that we are creative. So I think Creative seeing is only possible when you have you are very learned. So obviously, uh, being learned to learn know a lot requires a lot of reading. We have to uh, engage with the world. We we'll have to uh, observe our surroundings. Well, a lot of these techniques, we actually do not know how to bring those techniques into our students. So if you're asking me, how do you design and how would you like to implement 21st century innovative learning and teaching, I think people have thought a lot. A lot of our previous speakers have a lot of theories. They propose a lot of it. But implementation is where it gets difficult. Furthermore, we keep on saying design thinking. How do you teach design thinking? According, well, I have done more research and I've gained more insight into that matter. I believe we should actually ask how do we cr induce creative insight in our student first? So would that entail reading more, looking at more at other things, etc.? Even though they have insight, they still have to actually create something. They must they must man, make maneuvers to uh, coordinate, to make use of resources in a practical world, to establish a actual system. So you can see a lot of the times in education, we would uh, limit them in the bottom left hand corner. You see here we would limit our students to work under a uh, established framework they have to read they have to discuss we have to they have to engage in creation and creativity but a lot of the times in the actual real world a lot of things are happening how can we co connect them with that and of course a lot of the times we have to engage in group discussion to find these answers. Actually, I have uh, 
other understanding pertaining to social innovation and social. Uh, but I think I will leave that to the panel discussion, and I will talk about that a bit more. Um, to talk about our creative social projects, how could that have anything to do with democracy? How could that be uh, uh, innovative and perhaps uh, How, how could it uh, have something to do with the homeless or the elderly, or how, how, how does it relate it to students? So I would uh, save all of that to the panel discussion, and then we will discuss that in length. Thank you, King. So I think we uh, heard a lot about uh, creative insight. Insight is necessary, and action is also necessary in order to create our future. So the speakers have talked about uh, several aspects. Uh, everybody have mentioned that uh, what internal characteristics and what capacities must future ed educators have. They hope that these educators would be resilient, they would be full of curiosity and full of life, and they would know more about the world, etc. We hope that our educators could develop and cultivate these qualities first within themselves, and then they could bring these experiences to their students to read more, to learn more about different things, to uh, participate in their community, to uh, engage in empathetic thinking in order to create different learning experiences. And ultimately, how could these impl implement what they learn? How could they do uh, bring forth their experience to their students and when they work on the front lines? That's also important. So we now invite our three guest speakers in our panel discussion. If any uh, members online and offline, any members of the audience online and offline would like to ask any questions, please type your questions in the question box or type in your comments. And uh, we would respond to those questions and comments during our panel discussion. So we were delighted that uh, all of the three speakers are once again on the stage again and we could engage in the discussion. So just now, I want to. Uh, I want to continue on what King said. We're talking about education innovation. We're talking about the future of education. But all of our guest speakers have talked about uh, the many links between social innovation and education innovation. People would like to uh, introduce society and teachers in training to the future of society and education. Could King talk about what the importance is of education innovation and how does that connect with our uh, training of our future teachers? I do not necessarily agree that social innovation is very important. But uh, let us return to the uh, way we think about the question. Social innovation is uh, just a, a, a latest fad. If I could go back to my slide before, actually, I think a lot of these uh, projects in the area of social work, social welfare, is already a, a form of social innovation. Basically, in the world of social welfare, they have to deal with a lot of society's woes, including the problems of the youth. But a lot of the times, innovation in social welfare or uh, their way of doing things is limited within a certain framework. But another, uh, what well, another uh, area is known as the innovative space, like scientists, like artists, etc. They actually have a lot of creative social projects. These creative social projects. I would call them uh, socially uh, guided projects. So in other words, uh, they are engaging in certain projects, but these projects do not necessarily become a form of innovation. But as I've said before, innovation is a relative concept. You have, it is only innovative if it's relative to something. So these uh, socially guided projects, some of them actually would um, Achieve, achieve greater heights, and after that, what would they become? So innovation comes in many tiers, many levels.
so because your innovation project has uh, has achieved success, so certain people like uh, students and the elderly would benefit from that. So we would say that to those students and to those elderly, that group of elderly, that counts as an innovation. So in the future, if you extend that, if you benefit an institution, or that would be an uh, institutional innovation. If it changes a uh, social system or it impacts a social system, then it will become a social innovation. Or it could be a globalized uh, innovation like Wikipedia. That is also a globalized uh, innovation. So roughly, that's my understanding. So I do not think that uh, social innovation is something that we could achieve in one fell swoop. I actually encourage everyone to engage in these uh, socially guided uh, creative social projects, which are guided by the public. Thank you, King. So I've heard Jesse mention that uh, you would uh, ask your students to be involved in different uh, social projects. Uh, in other words, the different experiences which trying to re, re, uh, trying to respond to social issues. Uh, why do you design your courses this way? So I think in a lot of education reform work, we would talk about knowledge, skills, and attitude. So I, uh, as an educator in different settings, I've worked uh, for many years in the education sectors. I realize knowledge and skills could be learned online or could learn through could be learned through experience. But attitudes are very difficult to change. So we, uh, I've been working at uh, the Hong Kong Un Education University, uh, Hong, uh, uh, working in Hong Kong University for uh, several years. So I think these social experiences could really change the attitudes of our students. So that actually uh, reinforce what we know to be that actually reinforces our belief that we are doing the right thing. And in the past few years, a lot of our colleagues have been providing relevant courses for our students. So uh, some of our courses is more uh, like STEM education or language education. It has more to do with the core curriculum. And others are uh, more generic or focus on, say, what we call social emotional learning. All these uh, attitudes, knowledge, and skills is something that all future uh, teachers should uh, learn. Thank you, Jesse. So I have been uh, receiving questions online. So we all have a, a beautiful vision for the future. We want to achieve that. But let us return to reality, to our frontline teachers and our teachers in training. They have, in practice, situations and challenges that they have to face. So as we've said that our theme is to start from design thinking. And design thinking requires empathy to understand to what they face. So over the past year or so, everybody has been facing the pandemic. We have seen, uh, we have engaged in a hybrid mode of learning. We don't really see each other offline anymore. We, people are thinking. How could all of these learning experiences be brought to our students? So how could all of these capacities and experiences uh, be nurture our students? So we have said that uh, teachers have different, uh, our students have different types of uh, capabilities. And how could we implement those elements into our actual teaching and learning? We're talking about maker teaching and STEM teaching and thematic teaching. How could that be connected with uh, our students? How could we actually bring these elements to our students? Let us ask Patrick. So over the past year, because of COVID, everybody has faced a lot of new challenges. We have to relearn our things. And uh, well, thank you for um, Professor Seals, uh, different types of innovation. So I feel is that um, we at education is acting slowly. If you look at uh, fintech, they have profits, so they, they react quite quickly. So we have been testing and using different uh, technologies uh, from branded to hybrid. Uh, we, all, we have to redesign all of our classrooms. And I also see that, uh, so if you look at the teacher's training, 
as well as in the university, when we have meetings, so we talk about AI, we talk about the AI implementation in STEM. A lot of uh, big, uh, big words, but it's not easy for us to do AI. In teacher training, as well as for students, one important thing is that we have the first experience. Students can really go to the university, face uh, and face with the teachers and uh, and their parents as well as uh, the other students. They have to think about uh, what knowledge they have learned and what, how to apply the the uh, teachers' learning strategies. So it's not easy for them. They have to do the capstone as well. So they have to design uh, something as um, the uh, graduation project. So they are uh, their future teachers and they have learned from their practical environment. So we have seen that this is a very big achievement. After all, a lot of learnings happen online or offsite in classroom. So uh, to learn knowledge, uh, some students said that uh, they they just uh, keep online, but they are not learning. Just as uh, learning said, learning by learning, learning by doing, is our through experience is also important. Okay, what about uh, King and uh, JC? Is there any further sharing from both of you? Personally, I think. Teachers, if they are willing to think of uh, some of uh, the innovative uh, priority projects by themselves, not rely on or not following too much from the establishments, this will be better for the uh, in a uh, better for them to get a good attitude on innovation. The reason is that in the past few years, we have been talking about design thinking very frequently. So all of a sudden, the whole world is, the task is talking about design thinking. But if you look back, for this um, view is no longer an innovation. And comparatively speaking, if everybody talks about it in the world, and that it is not an innovation. so. Why don't we find more insights in addition to design thinking? What else possibilities can we find? For example, experiential learning or fintech in our teachers' training to attract students to learn some other disciplines. If the teachers themselves have this attitude of um, making, then Naturally, there will be a lot of teachers trying different new things. If they try on different new things, and they can magnify their efforts through the model I mentioned just now, even if in your experiment, you, for example, 30 or 40 people in a classroom, it is beneficial for them. But this, you can spread or expand your environment to more classrooms, to more schools, to more universities. So this whole process is making is a creative establishment. This is the progress. Uh, this is the process. This is what we lack of, of creative stability technologies or techniques. So we always think about ourselves, our own parts, and we do get it done, that's all. If we can buy some things from the shelf, some services from the market, then we can engage some people to teach us, to, to teach the students. I think regarding this question itself, from the education or from the system point of view, we have to think about the transformation of a creative. So we have to reflect whether or not we should follow the existing path. So uh, I'm afraid so I argue about the width of the understanding of the consensus in the society, in the education. A lot of teachers have to engage themselves in some other activities, including the principals, the presidents, and the management also participated and get involved in trying new things, changing the textbooks, changing the courses. A lot of innovations involved. 
and uh, in operations. They are also stakeholders. Uh, we have the social social consensus, and the in school level we have the cultural consensus, so that we can uh, tell we can allow our students or uh, whether they will be um, turn themselves into good educators instead of the. Uh, the um, uh, ordinary educators. Thank you very much for your sharing. Actually, we have been thinking about what is innovation and what is uh, the purpose or what is the motive of uh, innovation and uh, what method we can do it. Is the design thinking, is this a tool set or this um, the toolboxes? So is this innovation, so can we really bring about the uh, growth and the learning for our students? If this is uh, this is uh, our initial thinking, if this is the start point, actually in our just around us there are so many different possibilities. So so that we can really focus on what we can deliver to the students in their learning. I think that this is uh, the major focus for us. We have to think about how to design the process, how to design the experience. I believe that we talk about uh, innovation. We lead, take lead in the innovation. We must break through all the constraints in creating insights, creating experience. In addition to this, can we really create possibilities of breaking all the four walls for the new teachers, for the um, students who don't have so many experience? And so for different roles, different groups of people, how can we create spaces or opportunities to break through the uh, four walls so that we can really so that we can move forward to the future education. Once again, thank you very much for your sh sharing, and uh, thank you all online for your interactions with us. We will have another session with us. Please stay, stay tuned. Thank you very much. So after hearing your insights I will, from all the speakers, I believe that you must have got a better understanding on the uh, education for the future teachers. So next round will be a sharing session. So it's about enabling constructive learning with tools. So they're going to talk about how to, by leveraging the tools, how to practice the uh, the real learning. So next session, our speaker is uh, Mr. Gwen Chan, project manager um, of uh, PolyU, as well as uh, Mr. Abbott Yang. Abbott Tang. Welcome, everyone, and thank you for staying with us for this presentation. Just now, KK, and just now, KK already introduced to you all about the background of the project. In this session, Abbott and I are going to share with you more details about uh, this program, this course, how it is running, and uh, what achievements we have we have got, and uh, some cases. So the students uh, they are facing with the 21st century of uh, environments, as well as a lot of uncertainties ahead of them. And the students all have that uh, they can absorb more knowledge from a different source of, uh, of knowledge in addition to textbooks and uh, so that we can make the environment more relevant to them and more interesting. So for this, we just uh, mix the uh, social uh, innovation into the uh, textbook. We hope that uh, the learning in classroom learning as well as uh, the knowledge uh, acquirement uh, acquisition can build up, help them to build up the capability facing in the 21st century. We hope the students can innovate and be and make it a new power, a new driving force in the future. Talking about the innovation, the, the nature is when you're facing with complicated questions in reality, you can innovate and uh, resolve, resolve the problem some of the innovative methods. In this process, you need knowledge from a multi disciplines so that you can think of new ideas. Meanwhile, the social innovation can also provide a, a true scenario for students to explore, to, ex to discuss, to learn from the reality so that they can get enriched knowledge and make their learning process more relevant to them. So practices, our previous speakers are already mentioned about authentic uh, uh, experienced learning. Through these learning methods, 
students can get more devoted, devoted into learning and create more possibilities. As for design thinking, it is a systematic way of thinking. And through, through resolving the problems, through the problems or through uh, satisfying the needs for the future needs, and uh, they involves uh, the uh, the they involves uh, the uh, designing the uh, uh, the empathy the uh, prototyping and the tests. Now, just now, the uh, previous speakers already said when we use or when we adopt apply this uh, design thinking, we can also help students build up the empathy. So uh, education needs empathy to design a course so that uh, students can absorb the knowledge easily. In this project, students, they have uh, group work. They have different possibilities. And uh, they can work together with other members in the team to develop some, for example, the uh, cooperative uh, corporations and uh, collaborations, as well as reflection and resolving problems in the project. In this project, we have evidence-based research. We create a better learning environment. We also train, use the train the trainer method to help the future teachers, helping them with their learning. Our methodologies are based on the constructive uh, theories of learning. So these set of uh, theories is, are dedicated in building up a student-centric environment, giving them full play of, a, of um, uh, creating cos possibilities and as well as the capability of absorbing and resolving problems. And the students can apply what they have ex got in experience and construct their own knowledge. Meanwhile, they can absorb new information, new knowledge. Then talking about knowledge, the knowledge is still there in the students' uh, brains. It's not that the brain exists in the teacher's head and then pass it to the students. Their knowledge is still in the student's brain. And they generate the knowledge by themselves in a more active way. So just to echo back the constructive um, theor theor um, theology theory. So we talk about the constructive uh, methods. So one effective method is that we create a, a meaningful object or entity to enable our students to absorb their knowledge easily. As for the establishments, that is, uh, we the, uh, establish some uh, meaningful experience. And in a collaborative environment, students, participants share and, uh, and share the uh, way of uh, our process of uh, learning. In our plan, we created a lot of uh, useful tools, some learning tools to help the students. These learning tools, so these are the meaningful objects. They can per help the students in their learning, just like uh, designers in, in thinking and in doing things. This program, in this program, we hope that we can build up the competences students need for the first century, first, uh, 21st century. In the past three years, our achievements, we tried this in 155 154 workshops in 17 universities, and over 4,000 students participated. And that's in four, four courses, including the core modules, science, art, uh, society-related courses as well. In addition, we also we conducted 21, uh, 20 trainer trainer workshops. 71 were on job, and uh, some of others are the future teachers. As for our courses, we have applied the cooperative method. In this method, in addition to our programs, the students' participation in different projects, and we ran this workshop together. Specifically, we work together with the teachers in the participative uh, uh, universities. We design the workshops together. And uh, we add some specific time, specific courses, as well as the scope of knowledge that teachers are going to deliver. So this knowledge will be the main subject for the workshops. 
and it provides a foundation for our learning. And we would engage with our designers and teachers to talk about social issues. This issue is a real practical, real-life issue, and it will be the starting point of social innovation. That way, we could link up social innovation to specific knowledge in uh, the core curriculum. And we would make use of uh, design thinking, like uh, our processes, our attitudes, and our capabilities in order to help our students to solve the issues at hand. So next, I'll hand over to Albert. Thank you. So uh, I'll be talking about well, so we have many different projects, and every time we uh, do these pro uh, workshops, there are a lot of participants. We will go to secondary schools to design the workshop alongside teachers. Firstly, we would identify certain issues which has to do, which is relevant to their own uh, subject, and in each subject, we would find a designer or a social innovator to lead that workshop. And apart from that, in each individual smaller group, we would have group facilitators. Group facilitators would come from the poly school, poly unit, poly U school of design, people who are studying design, and other Hong Kong university students who are studying uh, education. So we want uh, teachers who are in training studying for an education degree to experience such ways of teaching and learning at an early stage. So it actually counts as a type of teacher training. Furthermore, we have done a lot of train-the-trainer workshops. It's part of our entire plan. Apart from sharing our own experiences, uh, we actually would like to, uh, in our interactions with teachers, we also learn other things because we ourselves well, we are absolutely not uh, teachers ourselves. Uh, when it comes to more specific requirements within the curriculum, we don't know that very well. But through tr collaborating and training with these teachers, uh, through these workshops, which are not one directional, but a two way street. And in those uh, workshops, we explore certain issues and we reflect on those issues in order to improve our project and our plans. So, on the one hand, we're training teachers, and on the other hand, we are training our own team. And furthermore, uh, we, our project is mainly design thinking oriented, but we also know that. Uh, because of uh, the own design thinking's uh, historical background, it is a very abstract idea. It doesn't necessarily work very well if you implement it, if you graft it onto the uh, education system. But uh, it is just thinking, right? So it's even worse than what Professor Siu has talking about. It is not when uh, it's not even talking. You just think. You're even talking to other people. So this is actually a bit misleading. Design thinking is not just a way of thinking, it's a way that designers work. So apart from design thinking, we would have design playing. Uh, so we would borrow uh, the ideas of gamification of education. Uh, not only that, we would also uh, use certain co-design methods in design theory. So we would like to engage in co-design projects. We would find uh, designers and professionals and uh, people from different areas to engage in design. It's actually quite difficult to do. So we have to find a common point for people with different languages to do the same thing. So the best way to achieve that is through gamification. The stake is very low. Uh, everybody could participate in very easily. People would pay with uh, like chess or other games. And during that game, we would discuss uh, more uh, serious uh, issues. So we would uh, gamify everything we do. And finally, echoing back to what we've said before, learning by doing. Because we start from a design perspective, we think that learning by making is very important. We think that uh, when people think that there is a, a way, you can sit there and think. But when you are working and we are doing things, uh, you would engage in a different thinking process. So we put a lot of emphasis on uh, teaching these students or lead, when we are leading the students to do design projects. Uh, we can't just sit there and draw diagrams and draw graphs. Uh, that is not design. We have to actually make something. That is what design means. So this is one of the things, one of the elements which we put a lot of emphasis on. So furthermore, uh, we also in our, throughout our plan, 
uh, there is a, a hypothesis. We think creativity or the capacity to design is not a quotient like IQ or EQ. We think that uh, creativity is a behavior or a habit. So we believe that we must provide the right tools to nurture and cultivate such habits. So when uh, the students are engaging with these tools, they are actually subtly engaging with certain design processes. It's not like we test this person that whether they are naturally inclined and talented design-wise. It's uh, the creative person is a person who constantly engages in creative behavior. So we would develop different tools catering to the needs of creativity and design in order to design different tools. For example, the first one is uh, about uh, observation. So let's say you ask a secondary school student to go to a wet market to engage in observation. And that's actually a very painful thing because a lot of things are happening. He or she does not know what he or she is trying to observe. We would have other uh, Observation frameworks under anthropology, uh, but these things are just like design thinking. It's very abstract. So we must uh, translate these uh, frameworks into a practical tools. As you can see in the slide, on the third part, there is a uh, user tool. It's actually a very simple tool. Within the observation framework, there are different perspectives for people to engage in observation. And one of them involves in uh, looking at what users there are and what people there are. are uh, are involved. So people they have this experience. Like, if you ask a secondary student to engage in interviews and surveys on the streets, it's a very painful experience for the teachers, the students, and the people on the streets because nobody wants this to happen to anyone. So we designed this tool. It's a uh, transparent film in the middle. You can take this. Even someone who cannot draw properly, you could just uh, trace the pattern. Uh, and to draw something, uh, a, a prescribed pattern. To be honest, uh, this the products are uh, the result is not stellar, and you know it's not like uh, this person who cannot draw suddenly becomes a person who could uh, suddenly who becomes a person who who have drawn for many years. But the miraculous thing about this is that. Well, if a student who does not draw, you ask him or her to draw something, the person would definitely say, I cannot do this. But with this tool, they would at least be willing to try. And furthermore, actually interviewing people on the street, serving people on the street is very easy. It's a form of habit. But uh, if a student asks uh, someone, can I draw you on the streets, uh, they would be more acceptable. So we design all these tools in order to make it easier for students to start observating people on the streets. So another thing that we do well at uh, designing is that we could visualize a lot of things, particularly in the recent years. Uh, I think people in general have been in co uh, has uh, learned about infographics. Infographic is a very good example. Infographics could um, take some abstract and complicated uh, data and concepts and make it understandable. So one of the most primal infographics are diagrams. So if there's a very complex piece of information, but after it's converted into a diagram, you can see the trends, you can see the contrast within between different information and the contradictions contained therein. We have a lot of tools to help these students to visually perceive such phenomena and information. These are also other tools we have. And next, uh, something that we've uh, emphasized on when people who, uh, for students who do not do design, do not do art, they would say, I'm not creative. So we would uh, do a lot of things to seduce them into trying new options and new tools so that everybody could uh, play this uh, small games. And as they play these games, they would naturally engage in creativity and think about new ideas. And there would be a lot of options available for them to choose. We no longer have to let our uh, imagination run wild. Actually, designers do not let our imagination run wild. The most important thing about designer is uh, limitations. These limitations provide, uh, gives them clue where, as to where they have to make a breakthrough. If you could do anything at all, that basically means you can't do anything at all. So our experience is that uh, 
uh, their favorite option is always to make a cafe or make a cafe in the park, make a cafe at home. So if you want them to, if you let them do anything at all, they would not do, end up with nothing. But if you give them um, interesting limitations, like oh, everybody who comes in must kneel down, they would think about very interesting thing. Mm. But uh, like they may still think of a cafe, but at least it would be an interesting cafe. So limitations are very important. Limitations. Well, limitations would invite them to think in a way that they would normally not do so. Not, not do so. So finally, even for a design student, this is something that we often skip. But when in design, this is very important. It's how to evaluate our design and decision making. So you know our secondary students, they may have three ideas. Naturally, they would have a preference. Finally, when they have to choose a good idea, they would choose this one. And why would that? Because they like that idea. That's the most frequent answer we get. But we have game-like tools embedding certain criteria therein. So when they are choosing these things, they have to think of which idea is more long term, which idea is uh, more urgent, um, which is more feasible, right? like it may be implemented today or tomorrow. So we would introduce such limits and such criteria to make them think of how should I adhere to this criteria and it's not just about my preference, right? Uh, or in this group, uh, he, he or she came up with the idea, so we would use that here and there. We would not, we would try to introduce these counterintuitive scenarios. So we have one minute left. Let me quickly talk about uh, the development of our research. Over the past three years, we have worked with uh, the School of Education at Hong Kong University to look into the uh, eff efficacy of our projects. So. The following themes are where we have seen more success. So I would like to quickly go over the key points which I think are worth sharing. Firstly, we have discovered that students could learn by making. And this is something very important to our course because our observation tells us that when students engage in making, They would go through an experiential learning process. They would participate in reflection, and they would uh, optimize their prototypes. So this is actually a new way of learning and thinking in order to help students to learn. Of course, when we're talking about learning, it's a rather broader term. We're focusing on the problems that they face. And secondly, it's in-depth learning. As uh, we have said uh, at the very beginning, learning by making is also the same thing because in this process, uh, we engage our students in higher level thinking. Uh, let me give you a brief example. For example, a, there's a group of students. These are uh, second S4 students. Uh, so in this process, we could change their attitudes towards learning English. In the past, they may feel, oh, my English is poor. Uh, how, how could I help these younger students? But precisely, they have to, because they have to design a project, they have to design a, a set of a curriculum for English uh, for uh, younger students. So they actually have to look into and what are the difficulties when it comes to learning English and to reflect on the learning English. Next, I will quickly flip through. Uh, apart from that, we would uh, develop transferable skills or a uh, lifelong learning. We could see also that students could also achieve this, it's particularly through this program. This would uh, actually uh, motivate them to learn. This is very important because they need motivation in order to learn these things. And yes, also to cultivate positive attitudes, including empathy and patience. Uh, this is uh, also very important in the future workplace when they face future challenges. So uh, you could find those examples on our website. Uh, we would like to share more examples with you, but uh, we ran out of time, so we don't have. If uh, in the discussion session, perhaps we would have a chance to do that. And finally, whatever questions you have, please send an email to us. And 
And uh, if you can click on the link, you could go on our website. If you want to follow our program and follow us on uh, other social media, you could send an email to us. Please send us an email. Thank you. Uh, thank you both. Now we're going to take a 10 minutes break. After that, we will have two group discussions. The on the line, you can find our two room options for the two group discussions. The group breakup session one and uh, two. In the uh, room one, we will have a uh, conversation between students and the teachers. In room one, we won't have any simultaneous interpretation. In breakup session two, we will talk about the foster student centered learning approach. So the teachers and the students, as well as uh, the uh, textbook dec decision makers, are going to have this uh, conversation together. Just a reminder, at the end of uh, the uh, seminar, please fill in the questionnaire and uh, leave your feedback to us. And uh, we have uh, the reward. We have the two sets for you. And uh, the winners will get a set of uh, these two sets. Thank you.
Okay. Welcome everybody uh, to participate in our social innovation, one, uh, the twelfth season of our social innovation symposium. So now we have engaged in the uh, breakout session two. Our theme is fostering student-centered learning approach. I am Gwen, your moderator. So in this session will last for forty minutes approximately. We have three groups of stakeholders participating in this session. There are uh, curriculum designers, uh, representatives from the education department, teachers, and students. So they would talk about creative projects and the experience in fostering student-centered learning approach. And furthermore, we would engage in a cross-disciplinary discussion 
the audience member could uh, type in your questions through the Q&A panel. So we're delighted to invite Mr. William Cheng. Uh, he is a senior curriculum development officer at the Education Bureau of the Hong Kong SAR government. William is uh, trying to uh, break through certain limitations in English education, and he is actively in amending uh, the ways of teaching in order to achieve innovation and to implement his innovative plans through different research and development. William, please. Good morning, everyone. So uh, my name is William Cheng. I'm from the EDB. Uh, I'm a part of the uh, uh, English language teaching team. So I'm mainly uh, taking care of our Net Scheme native English teachers so thank you very much for uh, JCTC uh, to give me a uh, opportunity to talk about what we have done over the past two years. Our project uh, is a design thinking inspired project called Make a Space. So I will talk about uh, what that means. So a picture is worth a thousand words. So here in my presentation, I hope that I could use a photograph or a picture to start it. The, the picture you see here now is uh, a uh, all girls school, which uh, collab we collaborate with. Why did I use this uh, photo? I am an English teacher. So if you think about in an English teaching classroom, uh, what would you see? What would you imagine? So I think 80% uh, of schools will tell me all students are sitting there. They are just passively listening to their teachers. It's a one-way street. More forward-thinking schools, you would see that uh, students would do presentations before the blackboard, or you could talk about uh, something per pertinent to the arts, like drama, productions, etc. But you would rarely see this in a school, where uh, students would walk all around, walk around the classroom, all go around. Is they are actually making something, creating something, as what Albert says. So you can see that the object they created is a lunchbox. Uh, there is a lot of opportunity during that process to solve their problems in English, to communicate with each other in English, to offer their opinions. So our project is. Uh, mainly about learning English, but there's a lot of design thinking elements and routines uh, per permeating through our project as well. So this is the name of our project. Uh, we would use the idea of make a space. This is the spirit we have. This is what we're trying to do. In an English classroom, we hope that we could cultivate creativity in our students, cultivate the capacity to collaborate and problem solve. A lot of our Talk, a lot of our speakers have talked about the four Cs. It's all there, but they're all now integrated in an English language classroom. So I won't go into the details here because there's a lot of other speakers before, but I'm actually a bit behind. This is the 2017 uh, Economist report where they have uh, published the report saying that in 21st century, uh, what are the most uh, most popular skills. I think everybody know about this, like uh, languages, STEM, or the ability to uh, integrate everything you learn, to learn the issues and the knowledge, or you have a very broad base of knowledge, or uh, even other soft skills like uh, innovation, leadership, or even entrepreneurship uh, techniques. I, I won't go into the details. Uh, they call this a constellation of skills. So these installation of skills in the West is actually quite popular. So in this project, our inspiration comes from a school located in San Francisco. So this San Francisco school, their principal has said something quite uh, provocative. So he or she felt that in the 21st century, employers don't really care about high scores in academic tests. Actually, what they hope for in their applicants and the graduates, they want them to be voracious. To be voracious means that you thirst for something, or you want to solve a problems, you will have uh, different opportunities to face different uh, challenges, and you use your techniques to solve those problems. So it's not necessarily greed, but it, it, it's, and also they have to have the tenacity to meet those challenges uh, despite the adversity. So in this project, uh, you can see that uh, how, how does this, uh, this is the project framework, and there are, we hope that all schools would have the elements we see here. So we would integrate all these 
uh, all these elements with design thinking in two ways to become this project. Because in our, of course, in our project, we did not mention the words design thinking. But uh, we, as a curriculum designer, we were trying to explore this issue and integrate these things. Uh, we are talking about English language education. So we've mentioned certain generic skills. I've mentioned the four C's and the problem solving. And here, we are also promoting uh, value education. You can see amongst seven options, uh, we are, you can see four categories. We have four out of seven categories. Perseverance, care, responsibility, and commitment, four out of seven categories. When you are trying to engage in the future of work, you, you need these things. You need perseverance to persevere until you succeed. It's not necessarily a skill-based project. It's also a value and attitude-based project. So more information of our, on our project. So this is a four-year project from year, year 2019 to year 2023. So this is our second year of our project. We have six schools participating in our, uh, in our plans. We have 17 teachers, and one of them are here. So involving over 500 students. Our target is for our seed projects, uh, we target our teachers. We hope that teachers could we could enhance the capabilities of teachers to plan their courses and deliver their courses in order to improve the English of our students. And you can see these are all very mainstream objectives. We're talking about the uh, creative space and techniques. And all of this has to do with uh, what the four C's we've mentioned and the P we've mentioned. And particularly, we hope that uh, student could have a creative mindset. And because uh, we, we, we are in the English uh, curriculum space, so we hope that these elements could be implemented in the, the English curriculum as well. And the teachers could think about what are the good what are good techniques they could use in teaching in order to bring these concepts and ideas into the classroom. And finally, is assessment. How do you assess the students? What what are the what outcomes? Uh, how do we assess the learning outcomes of our students? So the project is focused on these few points. Of course, English is the main thing that is definitely priority number one. And furthermore, there's the uh, students' independence and agency and collaboration. We need our students to collaborate. And another very important element is design thinking, and the thinking routine. Albert has a very good uh, has said it very well. Uh, design thinking is a very abstract idea, and we're thinking how could we bring this to schools? We would follow this these five steps, even though these five steps is not necessarily a linear thing for us to observe. But we are thinking about uh, we could break this linear routine routine down. Like for example, empathy. You could ask students these questions empathetically. Oh, try to walk in another person's shoes. Uh, what are they thinking? What do they care about? Try what do they what's their what do they sense? Like we try to use these step by step questions to understand what they have to think about in these five steps. And when it comes to ideating, it could imaginations could be run wild, but uh, ultimately you have to implement it, and then we have to offer a framework for our students to think about this. So uh, what? Uh, what criteria do they have to think about? We hope that through these routine, we could. Uh, Give flesh to design thinking. So one of the one of the focuses of our project is well, not necessarily what you see in the photo that you have to use all these tools. We don't really have that much resources to ensure that each and every school could have such rooms. But our tool, of course, number one is language, and number two is what I've talked about uh, our strategy. So we uh, mainly are focused about learning on English and. Here are all learning targets pertaining to learning English. For example, in thinking routine, we must use language to bring forth uh, what we want to express in the sc uh, at, uh, at school. So this is something that have to do with language. I can't just explain everything with a look, can I? So what is happening in this project? Apart from COVID-19, I really thank all our teachers uh, who have thought of a lot of possibilities, uh, a lot of things in order to make this project possible. So the, each school made a handbook in this year. The hand Handbook uh, lets the teachers lets the teachers and students know that this is a whole year project. Throughout the year, uh, the teachers would uh, engage with their students to bring the students through their journey. And furthermore, Albert has worked with us in uh, professional development, and our team has participated in it as well. Number three, there are three types of school. The first type of school is people who start joined very early because of their schools and their environment. 
so they could start thinking routine uh, in the past two years already. And secondly, the students start to uh, schools start to infuse these elements into their curriculum and material. And thirdly, the most forward-thinking school is this school. They actually try to use design thinking to drive the curriculum. How does this uh, course organize? They try to use design thinking because, uh, well, they are, we have three types of schools. So you can see that our students have made these lunch boxes. I can show everybody. So we hope that w w what we want to see in a maker's classroom, uh, where the students should know what we should do. Making elements, we must do, make these things, we just create these things, and there must be a thinking routine, which is embedded in the design thinking process. And there must be a lot of opportunities to use English. I think that's basically what I want to share today. If you feel interested about this project, you could scan this QR code or contact me. So I think I could uh, say a bit more in, uh, in Q&A about this project. Thank you, William. So uh, I think we, just like what William has said, uh, we, uh, I, Albert and I, we participated in your project and we have uh, offered our advice and to us this is a very amazing thing because i see that uh, in your seed project william you actually Im implemented this into the curriculum to help students learn english of course uh, as everybody has heard that under william's project there are two frameworks firstly is design project and other is the thinking routine so i'd like to ask william this could you share with us uh, how are, how do these two frameworks help our students learn English? Could you uh, offer more examples to illustrate uh, how thinking routine works? So let me hark back to what Albert have mentioned. The design thinking is really a very abstract thing. I think for adults, uh, this is not problematic, but sometimes we have to explain to teachers. I, I forgot to mention this just now. When we're trying to sell this project on design thinking, our teachers would ask, uh, uh, I, I don't see uh, the words design thinking in English curriculum. How does that have to do? What does that have to do with uh, English? So ask them, when you're teaching composition, when you're writing a certain piece of text, there's a process. Um, the teacher the students have to know uh, who they are. Uh, the students have to know to do who they are writing to, what elements they have to put in the text, uh, and you cannot finish the thing in one draft, in multiple drafts, and a lot of changes. So this is actually quite similar to design thinking. The difference is being that you have to break things down a little. For example, empathy. You think about what does your recipient want to get. Like as a person who filed a complaint, uh, what? How did they feel? Uh, what do they uh, want? What kind of response do they want? So another scenario is imagine if scenarios, right? You have to when you want to improve your writing, could you use different words? Uh, change your way of paragraphing? Could that uh, you know? Could that enhance the impact of your work? So I think these are certain uh, specific things where we could we could uh, offer these practical real life things to our students to use. So I think uh, think, feel, care, uh, uh, there are two, uh, there are past purposes complexities. So this is a more complicated thing is to encourage our students to break things down and to look at that. It's not just, oh, this is, well, for example, you look at a remote controller, there are different knobs, different uh, electrical wiring, and you see how this all pieced together. Or to look at the system itself, uh, 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 parts, uh, parts, people interaction, uh, parts, people interaction. How do uh, different people integrate themselves together to create a system? We are trying to bring that into our schools as well. Very interesting. So up next, we would have a uh, cross-disciplinary uh, discussion session. So today we are delighted to invite uh, students and teachers from two uh, uh, secondary schools to participate in our sessions. They are uh, Ms. Yao, Head of Physics at St. Stephen's Girls College, and uh, Dora, and also Ms. Suki Chan, Associate Head of Liberal Studies and Integrated Humanities at Poisan Associate College, and, Mr. and uh, another student, Mr. Lau. So on the floor, we have had the guests say, let me ask a question to the teachers first. Actually, I know that, you know, teachers, they, uh, they always think about uh, new skills or the new ideas to help students in learning. So can you please share with us, in the past, in, in your learning, your experiential learning, in, 
So what are the differences between participating or not participating in our experiment? Miss Yao, perhaps you can start first. OK, thank you. I've been a teacher for many years. So in the past years, I have been trying new ideas. And now we'll talk about knowledge and skills. Kind of a boring, but actually, do students nearly not need knowledge that much? I would think about it. So in the classroom, do I, have, do I have to deliver that much about knowledge? I don't think so. In the past few years, I have felt that students' scores are not that important. But how to face with the future problems matters really more. So more problems and more difficult to, to get a job. In the past few years, so actually design thinking is very popular. For me, one benefit is that I can take this chance and um, apply these ideas, telling the students that now we have new ideas to play with. So in front two, we have a classroom-based learning course. So we ident we find uh, different teachers from different courses to help with. So one big thing is that we can sort the teachers' system. So because with the teachers' presence, the very often teachers would like to you know providing um, answers to students, guiding students in doing. But so what uh, you know, the advantages are what are capable or what. What uh, what um, the advantages that do the teachers have? Actually, teachers are their mentors. Teachers will tell the students, "Well, I don't have the answer. Just do it by yourself. Try it by yourself." In different stages, we help the students learning about resolving these problems. In the first year, we ask the students to resolve some fixed questions and their lifeline disease questions. In this knowledge, in this process, they involved about knowledge. Students learned it, loved it, and learned a lot about it. I felt that it seems that rather than uh, defining the problems of our eye by ourselves, it didn't sound that good. So later we changed. We asked the students to think about the problems. If you think it is a problem, uh, convince me. We we do, for example, you can do some survey to show you what is the problem and what they're going to do. It can be a very general idea. For example, is the mess in my room? I just want to do the uh, do the cleaning and the and uh, clean it up. Now then, I have you have to design what is the messy situation. A lot of benefits to the students through this way of learning. The is truly about problem solving. It's about the problem. So whether or not it is a very big problem or whatever problem they, they find. So they find problems, they resolve them, and uh, now they also realize whether there's room for them to keep improving. So this is also a learning process for them, a stage for them, and also experience for them. It's even helped with the teachers as well. So we spent a year on it. Of course, in the result, we see the results, and we were happy. So one good thing is that even if there isn't a very good result, even if it is a failure, still you could learn a lot in the process. Through this so you know program, so actually I uh, arranged for the uh, for the year uh, for the uh, uh, the high school, thirty students in the classroom. At this program, I also learned a lot. I think that uh, I could also uh, bring it to the. Uh, to the Form 2 pro, pro, uh, program. So very big, uh, very big difference. So Form 2 is that they found that their own problems of doing research about people around them. In the Form 1, we went to the communities. So in Form, in form 2, they interviewed the uh, senior citizens, those who retired people, asked them questions. So they had more emphasis inside. And uh, they have to they have to interview people outside of the community. They had to find out what what are needed in the community. So from this idea to doing the thing, as well as going to the community and the society, this is another level, higher level. And for me, uh, I also. I also got learned a lot and also modified my other designs as well. So we will go on designing different programs to the lower level students. Ms. Chen, so I, that, good morning. So talking about the situation in my school, so you know, in my team, in the um, past few years, we focused worked a lot on the uh, course as well as the issue based teaching. We also link the knowledge to the society or the the life they have. Therefore, we. Uh, 
emphasis a lot on the experiment, experimental learning and uh, value learning. We stress that students must go to the communities understanding what is happening in the design in the community so that they can identify the uh, problems and uh, define the uh, values. For example, the uh, my nation, minority nationalities, and uh, we went to the uh, temple and uh, the uh, mosques, and uh, we also interviewed the uh, the people from the Southeast, uh, South Asia. We talk about the topics of the global citizen. We went to the uh, activities from the Red Cross, and uh, they could feel what had happened to the to the children. So we really got ourselves in the society, in the community. So through this, they interviewed people, different people, trying to understand what was happening in this society. Meanwhile, they also set up the embassy and the values in this process. I think for our students and for the teachers, the whole process is very beneficial, very helpful, because in the process of learning and the teaching, we put the students in the center. They are the very basic point for us. They identified, they found the knowledge and the information. They set up what they wanted to do, and they streamlined all the information. So one step, uh, step by step, they learned about knowledge in the course. In this all in our project, I think one benefit is that it is helpful for the teachers as well as the students in the experimental teaching and uh, the value learning. The students were required to define the uh, problem and uh, the emphasis. So when they resolved these problems, they they wrote down the text in the, in the uh, classrooms, still within the classroom writing. However, they also gave us a lot of insights to all the teachers. So it is not only limited to the uh, normal matters, the designing masters. They also did efforts in making so. After participating in the Sanginova project, and uh, in our teachers group, we have uh, new ideas. For example, we in our uh, in our textbooks, we designed our own projects and our new texts. And uh, the students, uh, they actually uh, designed a product. They really did it and made it. And uh, for example, the food, so that they can we can reduce the uh, waste, uh, the waste from kitchens. So from so you know, we learned this factor, and we'll put it into our own teaching course. This program for teachers. In terms of our curriculum designing, it is very important. For students, it is also important. Because remember, for students, they just cooked some food by themselves. This is very impressive, very interesting scenes. So in the, you know, in their workshop, the students, they were, they were walking, they were excited, and they, when they bought the food, they remembered the, what type of food would be needed and how to buy, how to buy, what type of food would be nutritious and uh, could reduce less kitchen waste. So they just mix the, the knowledge from, from the classroom into their practice. The knowledge is no longer uh, in their mind only. The knowledge is already mixed into their life. This way of learning can deepen the student's recognition, and uh, such knowledge is already imp implanted in their life. Maybe in different parts of their life, they can be applied and bloomed in the future. Okay, thank you. This is a question to the teachers. So after listening to Ms. To Ms. Chen, so this type of uh, teaching, experiential learning, or design thinking in these courses. So they are able to help with their students in learning. It's a question for you, at what level do you think that they can help you in life or your your day to day uh, learning? And uh, Dora, perhaps you can start first. Okay. So actually, it helps both both for individual growth point of view. So so you know, one big benefit or one big assistance is that so I started learning how to think from different perspectives, identifying a problem, and then you can continue resolving the problem. So in this so you know program, of course, active aging was the thought was the theme. For those uh, the retired people who still have the capability, we interviewed them, helping them resolving problems. For this is any person if he is really uh, good at, at uh, the paper cutting. Uh, so, uh, however, not so many people about it because it is a pain point. He doesn't have the channel to communicate with others. 
Then maybe so nobody really cares to listen about him, his story. So we worked about the plan. So it's about a perfect um, story. So actually, we just in our design, we mix his products into it. So we also uh, we work out a plan, a story for them to to elaborate his plan to tell people about his story. So he was at the center at the very beginning, and he was. His song, there's no limitation to the ideas or the concepts. So I participated in this program and also I made some adjustments. Later, I was at the contest. And uh, we even further developed this idea into a senior person's is a collection. And so we also participated in the exhibition showing the, uh, for example, paper paper cutting, the videos, and so on and so forth, so that at the workshop, more people can uh, access their stories. And, uh, and that's still in low. OK, yeah, just as um, yeah, um, the other student said, it is very helpful for both sides, uh, both aspects. So uh, particularly in the life aspect, Talking about a design in your life, so you uh, in many things that you can be designed. For example, in our classroom, as uh, Miss Chen said, that in our classroom we tried the uh, cooking program. So we cooked the food. We, we didn't produce any unnecessary kitchen waste. So just as like from the classroom, when I get back home, when I do, when I get back home, when I cook for my family, I think about uh, reducing. Uh, using better ingredients in order to reduce the waste from a kitchen. Okay, thank you. So back to the decisions, decision makers' role. The one question for you is that, in your opinion, because we need a time, as teachers need time for preparation. You know, designing an activity, uh, and as well as the experience. In this regard, how can we make the balance based on your experience? Well, keeping a balance, is that this is an issue. For English schools in our project, we are different from other schools, maybe. So a lot of uh, attention must be put in language learning. So that's why teachers have uh, one more concern. That is how, you know, through the design thinking process, how can we enable students to learn the English language? So this is the one teacher here, he's from the, another school. So through our compliance meeting, that uh, college was very good. The whole textbook, we look at the whole textbooks together, looking at different courses and uh, where we can we can uh, put the uh, design thinking into it. You know, the uh, textbooks are based on English language learning. So we hope that uh, we can take care of both sides. So that, that was the second group of students. And so, so of course, one of the projects is faithful for those type of students. So now you use uh, the uh, uh, design learning in, in designing the curriculum so that we can identify the uh, opportunities to improve so that students can also have the opportunity to experience that learning. So what about the teachers? How do you design your curriculum to get the balance? Well, well it, first of all, it doesn't hinder the student's examination. We just uh, tried all the means we, we can think of, depending on the uh, situation in your school. You must be flexible, first of all. When we talk about the problem solving base, we didn't have uh, one single class for that. So how can we get more classroom, the time for classroom? We have to sell to the project to the students first. So for each each project, for each course, and the one we have a uh, one hour of a uh, classroom time. So. And so you have to think about uh, so what they can learn from uh, that uh, time, that class. So one thing the students have to change as well. Now they learn more when they do things. They care about the society more. They care about the people around more. So this is also a growing process for them. And we're talking about a big, a lot of students, a lot of teachers, they are willing to 
to learn the uh, one class to you. So that's why it w we were successful in the first in the first year and in the second year we also made it into our courses. Once you 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 have this framework inside, you cannot do it alone. You must have a teacher's team. At the very beginning, when we prepared the plan, I invited many people to attend colleagues from different classes, different subjects, so to help. So you 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 must leave that uh, knowledge background because you have so many helpers. So one dynamics is very good. Actually, teachers from different subjects, uh, the way the way of thinking are very also different. So when you work together. So everybody, we look at different ways from different people, and when we put them together and I think it was a different scenario. It's so different. I believe that if it were just me alone, there's no way I could figure all this out. So after I participated in social innovation program, when I work with them, your thinking is so different from us, so so different from teachers. So I, I, I could learn new things uh, uh, from you guys as well. So I think constantly engaging in exploration is very important in curriculum de design. So I think we are learning from you as well, because when it comes to teaching, we know nothing at all. So you mentioned this point uh, on work collaborating and division of labor. We hoped that uh, students could learn through a group discussion as well themselves. I want to ask Ms. Chan this. When it comes to difference in learning capabilities, how do you deal with that in your day-to-day -day teaching? And during experiential learning, how do you handle that as well? So in the difference in learning capacities uh, comes in all sorts of forms. Uh, in my understanding, it could be uh, some people learn quicker or some people learn slower. It could be a difference in learning habits. So in our liberal studies team in our school, we put a lot of emphasis on a diverse input in order to respond to student needs. So this input is in our school-based curriculum is not just a text. Even within the same message, we would have all sorts of uh, images and videos. We hope that uh, different students with different learning habits, when they engage with the same material, they could obtain the same understanding. And we probe put a lot of emphasis on a diverse output of missions, learning missions. So some students may work better alone, others work better as a group, some may be good with language, others is good with math, some people are good with la uh, images. So in certain tasks, we would have a space for them to choose uh, what format they opt for to exemplify their own learning. So that's how we cater to those uh, differences you allude to. At the same time, the progress of learning is different. So as some of our previous speakers have mentioned, some sometimes we would engage in a flipped classroom model. So st st students who have learned uh, faster could uh, engage in this flipped classroom and engage with online uh, curriculum in order to learn uh, extended parts of the course. So um, as someone who tried to organize uh, the curriculum, under the context of Hong Kong education, what strategies are most effective when it comes to implementing this new form of learning? I really agree with what Ms. Yao has said. The most important thing is space. A lot of times when we go to the schools, when we work on these projects, particularly over the past two years because of the pandemic, people could imagine when uh, schools are switching into a new mode of education, what would be sacrificed? The first thing that would be sacrificed is these projects. I, I understand that perfectly. I'm not blaming the schools because the schools have so so much concerns. In response to your questions, firstly, we have when we come to discussing this with the schools, we have to be upfront about uh, what positive impacts we could offer this uh, particular subject, because this now is the third or fourth year of fourth year of our uh, plan. So we have more positive cases and more positive examples to show these schools and tell these schools that if you work towards this direction, what could you see, what could you achieve? So schools could see that what are the feasible outcomes when they engage in these projects. So it's really easier to persuade these schools. So secondly, uh, I mentioned in a lot of schools because English teachers are really, are really concerned that they cannot complete the curriculum. So this is quite normal. 
So we would actually go to the front line to tell them how this could work. They have to see it. It's not just an idea, right? We have to hold their hands. But the bad thing about that is that we have to go there themselves. Uh, so we have to lead the project. But if it's a good thing, it's not necessarily a bad thing for the first few years of the project. But by the fourth and fifth years of the project, we, are, we will let go of their hands and they could lead the way. And we are very happy to see that some schools could let net teachers to lead the project and uh, it, they will uh, engage in this project in throughout S1, 2, and 3 in the next year. So all of these examples are very encouraging. They could inspire other teachers. Finally, I would like to ask the students. So you are the future. You are our future. According to your experience and your experience in learning, well, what suggestion would you make to your teachers? How should they support your learning? And uh, that would be which would be most effective. So let me start. So I feel students uh, should get an opportunities to take the lead. Uh, they could decide what to do, and the teachers could help them. So the first time when we actually uh, do these things, we learned how to uh, do woodwork. And all of that is something that we wouldn't get to do uh, under normal circumstances. So we hope that uh, teachers could give us more resources to try different things. It's not just about sitting there and listening to a lecture. Uh, we would have more opportunities to uh, to do such workplace learning. We hope that there would be more scenarios for different uh, different students to interact and uh, use their hands. Uh, that would be beneficial to uh, progress of learning. So 30 seconds, please, Mr. Lau. I hope that uh, I, uh, my recommendation to the teacher is that they should give us space. And we, the students, could establish rules ourselves and to set our own learning goals. And subsequently, in this space, students, based on what they have learned and what information they have gathered, they could uh, make models or write, uh, pro uh, write reports, and they would have more opportunities to realize their actual learning. That, that's very good. So here ends our panel discussion. Thank you very much for everybody's participation. So I think after uh, the sharing of experiences from our multiple speakers, everybody has learned a lot. So here we are at the end of our symposium. Once again, we would like to invite Mr. Ling Ka Ken, director of the Poly U Jockey Club Design Institute for Social Innovation, to deliver concluding remarks. So once again, I have to thank uh, all of the speakers who have participated in our symposium and to all of the students and teachers who have shared their experiences with us here. So today's symposium So in this three-year experiment, today's symposium is the most important thing we have done over the past three years in our project with regards to education. As I recall, when we started this project, I have offered my colleagues two pieces of advice. Firstly, when we are sharing design thinking with students and teachers, we should not start by saying that design thinking comes in five steps. We should avoid saying that. On the contrary, we should guide them step by step through through the implementation process of their projects to lead them through the five steps and then to co conclude. And my second piece of advice to my colleagues is that we, we should not have a standardized course where we would apply that course to each and every school we work with and teach them that. We should not do that. We should participate in the process alongside and uh, this process is a process of problem solving. And these issues must be raised by the participating institution themselves to us. And after this issue is raised, uh, this, we would then solve this issue with the teacher and then to reorganize what methods should we use to guide these students to find uh, the answers. I think we have 
succeeded in both points. And precisely because of these two things, it makes the work of our colleagues more difficult. But I think everybody learned a lot during the process. And most importantly, every time our teachers, uh, our colleagues were talking with uh, the participating institutions, we started out uh, being clueless. But precisely because we are clueless, we started a uh, exploration process alongside those uh, schools, and we ended up with very good results. I think that this is this is a most valuable and important process in social innovation and uh, innovative thinking. We have all been students before. As students, looking back, it's a very short time, but the lovely memories we have from our school days benefits us for life. Yesterday, I went to uh, the SKH uh, to share with our colleagues what we have done at JCDC. When I started sharing my experiences with them, I used the motto of my primary school at start. My uh, motto is, uh, to serve but not to be served. I think that uh, we have adhered to this idea and hope that through our work, we could create a more beautiful future for our society. Here and now, I would like to once again thank all our participants. And I could say that in the next three years, we are very fortunate to receive continued support from the Hong Kong Jockey Club Charity Trust so that we could continue the Jockey Club, JCTC, So Inno projects. So in the next few, three years, through consolidating and enhancing social innovation, we would uh, continue our work in the past three years. And we hope that social innovation would become uh, uh, more popular in our society. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Mr. Lin Ka Khan. So here ends our symposium. Before you leave, uh, please remember to fill out the survey through the QR code you see on the screen to give us your valuable feedback and to fill out the survey form with your private details in order to obtain a copy of our social innovation handbook. We hope that in the future, we would continue to engage with uh, different parts of society to continue to our social innovation journey. Please follow us on our journey. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>